Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We made it. We are at the end of the 1950s and the end of our second season. I am so excited to be here today talking peanuts with you where we're going to wrap up the the first rock and roll decade and and maybe talk a little bit of where, about where Mr. Schultz is going to take us from here. How are you? You doing good? I'm good. I'm your host. I'm Jimmy Gownley. You might know me from my comic book slash graphic novel series, Amelia Rules, or my other graphic novels, uh, Dumbest Idea Ever and The Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. Joining me, as always, are my pals and co-hosts. He's a playwright. He's a composer, both for the band Complicated People as well as for this very podcast. He's the original Amelia Rules editor, the co-creator of the first comic book price guide, and the creator of such amazing comics as Strange Attractors, A Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River, Michael Cohen. Hey there. And he's the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000 as well as a former vice president of Archie Comics and the current creator of the Instagram strip Sweetest Beasts, Harold Buckholtz. Hello. Guys, we made it. Do you think we, Did you ever think we'd get this far, that we'd get all the way to 1959? Sure. Wow. Well, you're, you're a hopeful person. That, that's, that's good. And it's we're always... done. That's the last, the last peanuts. <laughs> that's it. He retired <laughs> as champion. If he was any other cartoonist, apparently that's he would have. Yep. But he was just getting started. It is great. What, so, Michael... All right. Give me your overall impressions, having now freshly read the first decade of Peanuts. Why don't you just uh, sum it up for us here? <laughs> no pressure. I would say uh, the stuff we covered in season two is one of mankind's greatest achievements. <laughs> it is. So it's up there with the pyramids. <laughs> in terms of pop culture, I don't. the only analogy I can... I don't know if it's an analogy, but the only comparison I can make it, it is yeah. the Beatles. At least in my lifetime, no one has consistently done such a huge outpouring of amazing, innovative material, just far above everybody else. I mean, it's almost unquestionably the best in its field. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. And fast. I mean, Schultz was doing it every day. The Beatles were doing three albums a year when they started recording right i think that's part of the key to it is that you have to be fast you have to constantly be yeah out there. and it constantly improving so that's not hyperbole no. no i agree so harold uh how about you what's your take on the 50s well it's a much different strip than it was when it started i i would guess more so than any other decade of peanuts everything is in full swing here and it's just a wonderful strip it's this is the strip that i remember as a child growing up it's 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 moved into that it took a number of years to get fully to the feel of what i'm used to but it was an amazing journey all the way through just to see him continue to find his way i think it's just amazing uh amazing how far he's come and what he's innovating and how he's just kind of gone to a place no one else has gone before absolutely i, I mean it, it i i agree with both of your your statements there and and yeah i do i i think this is one of the the high achievements of of art in in mankind's history as well i i, I love it so michael let me ask you this on this particular reread is there anything what, what what was the thing that like maybe jumped out at you the most maybe something that you didn't realize or that you had forgotten uh just what was the the thing that struck you the the strangest or the freshest this time i had no idea the letter W, <laughs> the the shape of the letter W was so important. My God, if you don't talk about that for at least 45 minutes a week. <laughs> um, on this reading, and it's probably been 15, 20 years since I last read all those books. It was, it was just that it developed so much faster. I mean, we've spoke, we've we've talked about this before. It's just it was awkward for a year or two, and then it just seemed to become more and more familiar quickly. If I was recommending to someone, where do I start with Peanuts? Someone who'd never read it. Last year, I would have said, well, maybe 1957, but now I'd say, well, start in 1954. Yeah. 
Harold, how about you? Yeah, it's not a reread for me, I guess, because I so much of this I'd never seen before. I knew how it began and I knew kind of where it ended just by seeing really early strips in his little historical books about peanuts. But I don't know. I, there's, I guess I can't be surprised or there's nothing particularly that strikes me that I can speak of. It, it, they were, it was a great read, fun all the way through, and it was fascinating to see it change over time. Well, the thing that uh, there are a couple of things that surprised me considering this is, I mean, sometimes some of these strips I've read a billion times and some of them I've read twice now because a lot of them, none of us have read because they were never reprinted. Uh, but the thing that struck me is how fast the Sundays got good and how good they were, how much better they were rather, even than the dailies, almost as soon as they started out. I think within you know two months of the Sundays starting, everyone was just beautiful and classic. And I think when I saw them previous to this, uh, you know, they were printed out of order and in, in little different collections here and there. Uh, I never really got the sense of them as a body of work unto themselves. That, that was the first thing that really surprised me. And the other thing that surprised me is that, yeah, we talk about how quick it developed, which is is true. But we are at 1959, which is a decade, basically, into the run of the strip. And we still have we've just seen the first psychiatry booth. Snoopy's just gotten on top of the doghouse. You know, uh, we saw the first great pumpkin strip last year, uh, the first Sally last year, but we still have so much of, you know, the flying ace, the famous writer, the French foreign legion strips, peppermint Patty and Franklin and Marcy and all that stuff. Woodstock is still years away. So I- I'm, I'm shocked that I, you don't have eight years to develop a, pop culture or property these days i mean is there any version of this that you can think of that someone would be able to achieve a similar thing in terms of scale and just the ability to slow growth harold in today's climate um and well the one place i can see it is that dedicated person who would do it themselves they go online they create a strip they keep at it and they may or may not build an audience but that's the place to do it now because there is a place to have a potential audience, at least right online. And uh, that didn't really exist in Schultz's day. That's what we have now. And so I've seen a lot of artists, dedicated artists who have, you know, they've gone through a decade of building up a strip. They just did it on their own terms. And that's remarkably what Schultz seemed to do, even though he was working within a, you know, a big corporate structure. Right. Right. Yeah, it's amazing that he was able to do that because, like you say, now it's on the fringes because everything's kind of on the fringes. Everything right. is a smaller piece of the pie. Uh, but he was right absolutely at the heart uh, of pop culture. And like Michael was saying earlier, it does beg comparison to like these rock groups like the, that it just dominated culture. It's hard to imagine a comic strip. Well, a comic of any kind really dominating the culture and, and it's going to just get bigger as we see in the 60s there's a night coming up where he has the number one show on television the number one comic strip in the world and radio city music hall is sold out playing a movie a charlie brown movie it's it's an insane amount of success he's about to have yeah and like 1959 we didn't mention something in 1959 was this was the first time they were animated because they were in ads oh, wow. for the ford motor company for the ford falcon so Peanuts, if you didn't know Peanuts reading the newspaper, this was the first time people would be aware of Peanuts for other reasons, I think. Right. And then, Michael, do you remember seeing any of those commercials as a kid featuring the uh, the Peanuts characters animated? I'm sure I did. I don't remember the car commercials. I mean, it was at the insurance. Is it MetLife? Oh, yeah. MetLife was for like 35 years. Yeah, That recently just ended, actually, I think. Really? Yeah, that was my first exposure to the animation. Actually, yeah. I, I, and I didn't like it. It it bothered me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's interesting because, and obviously that'll be something that comes up more and more as the years go on. Because I, I'm sure I saw the animation first, so I, I, I my brain wasn't even allowed to make a decision of oh, is this a good adaptation or not? It was just it was just peanuts. It it, it is what it what it was. But it obviously affects your 
enjoyment of the strip, the way you relate to the strip, when you came to it, just what era, when you were born, all those sorts of things. And it, even if even if the strips, like, you know, a lot of these strips that I love so much are from the mid to late 50s, even though I was reading them in the 70s to the 80s, right? And that's another thing that is a little different in that there's kind of a continuity in just culture and what a childhood would be from 1950 basically to 1990, beyond even, right? Where it's basically the same things. You're playing outside, you're going to school, you have little... Culture changes so much faster these days, wouldn't you say? Do you think it would be possible to maintain that level of zeitgeist in a continuing story these days, just with culture changing so much faster? Well, I'm not up on Doonesbury since like, I guess the 80s might have been the last time I saw that. Well, that that's, I, I'm guessing if it's still going, it's keeping up with the zeitgeist. Because that's the whole thing. It was very current. Yeah, I, I think Doonesbury does come out as a Sunday strip now. It's really weird to see it because it has digital lettering and digital inking. And it's it's like this very slick. Uh, it's about as far removed from those early Doonesbury's as you can imagine. But it, it's still around. But and it, yeah, it keeps current, of course, but it's not central to the culture. I mean, Peanuts was huge uh, and uh, a huge pop culture phenomenon for much longer than most things are. Yeah, true. If Schultz was going to keep up with the zeitgeist, he would have had to introduce the computers and, and, and phones, iPhones and at some point. Yeah, it changes everything. Yeah. And fortunately, he didn't have to deal with that. So, yeah. So we're a decade in. And he's just getting started, though. We have we have four more decades to go. And a lot of people will say that the 60s are the absolute peak. And it's certainly the probably the peak of it commercial and cultural relevance and it is an era where things just uh go from greatness to greatness it's it's really fun harold what are you looking forward to as we as we dive into 1960 well again my my childhood was reading mostly these 1960s peanuts i was born in 1966 and i remember you know i think we got our first peanuts collection maybe 71 72 and uh, those little Fawcett Crest uh, mass market books were a regular part of my life all all through the 70s. But I was usually about a decade back, not always, uh, in reading the strips. And I remember as a kid, being the kind of kid I was, I would look in the uh, copyright page because I found that that was where they showed what years were, were being printed. And I could tell that these were different over time, just like we saw this huge shift over the 50s. The nature of the strip did change over over this period of time. And so I started to learn, okay, I'm liking strips from this year, this these years, a little bit more than strips from other years. And so, you know, I would just make a habit of going back and looking at the years that they were from. And that kind of that kind of placed the strips in my mind. Uh, and the the years I remember I absolutely loved the most were 1964, 1965. So that's right in the middle of the 60s. Everything around it is great too. So I'm just uh, I'm just excited to go all the way through in order. I've never done that before, and uh, experience him getting to that sweet spot that I remember for me. Michael, how about you? I had the whole collection. I always thought the best ones were the early 60s ones, sort of roughly what Harold was talking about. I kind of distinguished them from by color, and the titles were always really stupid. Mm-hmm. There's one called As You Like It, Charlie Brown, <laughs> and I think that was my fave. I think it was an orange cover. So I'm looking forward to seeing if those actually are the best, because it seems pretty hard to top what you've just done. Well, I'll have to report on what color the cover is because Michael gave me his collection of Peanuts books, so I have them on my shelf now. I'm very proud to say. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I love the '60s stuff too. I think I like the '60s and the '70s probably the best. But I read ahead uh, into into 1960, 1961, and I was shocked. There was at least one thing that, if you and like I said, I've I've read it through entirely once. If you asked me, when did this certain thing happen? I would have said, oh, the early 70s. And it happens in the first few months of 1960. I I was absolutely shocked by that. So I'm curious to see if some of the things that I remember 
being more prominent later, if there's more of them that are sort of of uh, peppered throughout throughout the the early '60s. But regardless, we have coming up. We have you know the development of the psychiatry booth, with which we've seen for one strip. The development of Great Pumpkin, which we've seen for one strip. The World War One Flying Ace, where Peppermint Patty will be introduced. Woodstock will be introduced. Franklin, Marcy. It's an incredible decade of of, of comics. And I just can't wait to get to it. So, I, and I'd just like to also say, I'm so thankful for all you listeners uh, who are, are listening every week because we we have listeners from all over the world, which is amazing. And I know it's not because of us. I know it's because of Mr. Schultz. Uh, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you want to listen to us talk about his fantastic work. So, guys, how about we take a moment and we uh, answer some questions from the Internet? Great. Sounds good. All right. Let's get to it. Okay. Here we go. All right. Here's question one. Any insights into the song that has the lyrics, Charlie Brown, he's a clown. It never made sense to me until you were going over these early 50s comics. Was that song inspired by Charlie Brown's more mischievous, wise acre nature displayed at this time? Uh, the answer, according to the songwriters, uh, who are Lieber and Solar, is no. That they just wanted a hit for the coasters and they had yakety yak and were stuck. And couldn't come up with anything else. And he just thought of the name Charlie Brown. And he's a clown. What's weird about it, though, is he come, claims he had no idea who, who Charlie Brown was in 1959, which is when the song came out, which is suspect to begin with. But then what's weirder is in the American Masters documentary about Charles Schultz, they use it as like a running motif for the soundtrack, which is bizarre to me. I It has theoretic, the lyrically and... Officially, it has nothing to do with peanuts, though. So, but it is included in that documentary. You guys have any opinions on the Charlie Brown song? Anyone like that one? Is that a bop, as the kids say? At the time, I assumed that it was definitely a peanuts reference, but I wasn't really listening to the right. lyrics. But I am the authority on this because one of those songwriters went to my high school. Which one? Well, Lieber, Lieber stole her. I can't oh. remember. But anyway, yeah, if you listen to it now, it's clearly not the Charlie Brown we know, except maybe, like, why is everybody always picking on me? I mean, he's kind of a beatnik character, like, calls mm -hmm. the teacher daddy-o. So I think it was just a coincidence. <laughs> right. And unlike, hang on, Sloopy, which I was also convinced was Snoopy for years, <laughs> and he was hanging on to the wings of his triplane. <laughs> So anyway, you shouldn't ask me about this because obviously I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, look, there is a clearly a, an industry of unofficial Peanuts related pop songs, right? If you go to Charlie Brown song, if we posit that Hang On Sloopy was clearly meant to be Hang On Snoopy because what is Slo Sloopy is not a name. <laughs> and then you have, of course, uh, Snoopy versus the Red Baron, which was just, a, I mean, that... <laughs> They just use the the motifs from the and characters from the strip and just forgot to pay at first. <laughs> that that had nothing to do with the strip. <laughs> <laughs> Completely unrelated. <laughs> well, you know, if, if I were writing a song, I would be very reticent to say that something super popular um, that had super powerful lawyers <laughs> was based on something, <laughs> uh, just because someone could give you some trouble. But so, which high school did you go to, Michael? Fairfax. That's that's Lieber's. Okay, then it's Lieber because I know that he also worked in the local record store on Fairfax Avenue in L.A. But that was before my time. Wow. Well, that's that's really cool because yeah. So Lieber was a senior in 1950, they say. And so here's here's my little trivia on on this the song. The one thing that made the Charlie Brown he's a clown was actually not based on peanuts was uh do you know who who uh, did their first hit song who did lieber and stollers lieber and stollers was no. it big mama thornton was his hound dog uh no it was uh well at least in r&b it was charles brown <laughs> charles brown had the hit hard times when they were 19 <laughs> years old oh, they really? wrote it together That's so weird. it could be they were wow. thinking of that charlie brown might if i had to guess i would say they knew charles brown they'd had a hit with charles brown not too much earlier before that maybe it was like i don't know six years prior and then they heard of charlie brown who knows whether they were watching a ford falcon commercial and the name hit them and they were like 
Hey, yeah. that's that sounds fun because they they like to do like they also did songs like Yakety Yak and Hound Dog on Broadway, Stand by Me, Jailhouse Rock, Love Potion Number Nine, amazing, amazing number of songs, but with a lot of really clever, playful uh, lyrics uh, that were often a little yeah. out of the ordinary. So. Well, it, it makes me think of like, remember when Moon River came out uh, in Breakfast and Tiffany's in 1961, and they have they have that line, my Huckleberry friend. I bet you anything Henry Mancini didn't know anything about Huckleberry Hound, but it was in the zeitgeist, you know, the show was on yeah. you heard in the background or whatever. And so that Huckleberry was in his head. Maybe I mean, it could be Huckleberry <laughs> Finn, but I just think that was the time of Huckleberry Hound. I don't think that's a coincidence, but it, it was just floating in the air. Uh -huh. And he probably plucked it out. I, I doubt if Mancini wrote the lyrics, or did he? That's a good question. I don't know. Or whoever wrote it, I, I'm, I'm guessing. That was Michael Stipe's favorite song growing up because he thought it was about Huckleberry Hound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure every kid did. Well, sure, yeah. But that that question was from uh, David Scher, who uh, is a um, friend of mine, and he's a storyboard artist and writer on the new Looney Tunes. It's on, uh, each, I think it's HBO Max. And he's currently uh, working at Nickelodeon Animation. Really talented guy. So thank you for that question, David. Appreciate it. This is from Shaylee Robson, who writes, Hello, gentlemen. I love the podcast so far. And I'm curious, of all the characters in Peanuts, who is your favorite and why? Well, how about we, uh, we limit, this should be a decade by decade question. We should answer this for Shaylee every, every uh, two seasons, I think. So let's say right now, uh, just going from 1950 to 1959, who is your favorite Peanuts character, Michael? Well, he's he's not the funniest, and he's not the most obnoxious. It's got to be Linus. Uh, I mean, Snoopy would be the runner-up, just because Snoopy is always hilarious. Linus is a is just a very deep character, and. Uh, if he he works both as a foil and also as kind of a philosopher and it's i've never i can't think of another character in comics or even in literature certainly not a kid character who's so i mean he has contradictory elements in him but it seems to it seems to fit i mean he's like a genius who's totally insecure and afraid of the mm -hmm. world. Um, it seems like he can do anything, yet he can't function without the blanket. So I've always liked Linus, and, and probably throughout the rest of the run, he'll be my favorite character. Harold, how about you? I think I know the answer, but go for it. <laughs> yeah, my answer is Linus as well. I, I We're seeing him become the Linus that I really knew when I was growing up. I've said it before. Shaley, I've I really loved this uh, this character growing up. I identified with him. He was more real to me than my next door neighbors. Can't explain why. I was having this conversation with Charles Schultz that I wasn't having with anybody else, even around me, th through his amazing storytelling and sharing these inner thoughts of these these little pen and ink characters. And by the end of the fifties, uh, that that line is character. I mean, I just see myself in so many of these strips and, and, you know, I was able to laugh at myself through someone else's eyes that because there were, I mean, that <clears throat> I think of the one where <laughs> Linus, uh, Linus doesn't want to go trick or treating. And, and, uh, I can't remember exactly what, what terminology was, but it's like, you know, is this legal? <laughs> you know, I can go up to a door and knock <laughs> and ask for candy. Are they going to shiv me? You know, <laughs> well, what if someone knife, <laughs> <Someone man>? nice, <laughs> no one's going to knife you. But uh, <laughs> I mean, that that kind of stuff I absolutely related to um, as a character, and I was like, "Wow, that's uh, that just it just felt like somebody saw inside of me and was putting it on a, on a on a strip." And I was learning about myself through his insights of how the other characters interacted with Linus, which is pretty complex. Uh, so I'm super grateful to Schultz for creating Linus. And uh, so Shelley, that is my answer for the 1950s: is Linus. Nice. Uh, mine is Albert Payson Terhune. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go with an, a left field choice. I think it's Lucy. Lucy is my favorite character of these particular. She won't be my favorite character overall. But I think once she gets going, it makes all the pieces work. You know, she has the meanness of, of Patty and Violet, but it's not 
rooted in just meanness. You know, she has the crazy conspiracy theory mind. She also just seems like a genuinely fun kind of cool kid in a way, even though she's always, uh, you know, humiliating and torturing poor Charlie Brown. But I think if you take any of the characters out, you might be able to make Peanuts hobble along. But I think if you take Lucy out, it's going to hobble slightly worse. That's so. That's, that's a that's really interesting insight. Yeah, because she's got this connection to Schroeder. She certainly has a yeah. relationship with Linus that's very powerful. Charlie Brown, she is the one that brings out his personality as we know it, I think. Mm-hmm. And and Snoopy, she's she's definitely starting to have her own issues with Snoopy that are unique. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's a really fascinating insight. I think she is the glue and she seems to kind of amp everything up she everything gets magnified when you're around lucy yeah and everybody's personality traits seem to pop out yeah yeah it's like you know um famously uh when reggie jackson got sent to the yankee or you know was traded to the yankees um and they were talking about the the lineup or whatever and he said hey i'm the straw that stirs the drink and uh <laughs> you know i think S- charlie brown's supposed to be the straw that stirs the drink but Charlie Brown doesn't stir anything. He's inert. <laughs> so everybody's there kind of because of Charlie Brown, but the only one that gets things going is Lucy. Yeah. I think she's a great engine for the comedy. I think she's a great in- engine for the philosophy and uh yeah, she she's she makes everything shine just a little bit more. Thank you, Lucy. While being really mean. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh okay. So this is from Katie in Lancaster, PA. And uh, she asks, Jimmy, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be an artist in residence at the uh, at the Charles Schultz Museum? Yeah. Yes, I can. And she's actually an art student um, at my old um, alma mater of Millersville University. So, yeah, it's amazing. First off, uh, it w- it's you go and you spend a week there, I think, or at least I was there for a week. And the artist in residence part is like they have a desk set up for you and you just sit up there at this desk and you can draw and people are going through the museum and they could come up and watch you draw and they could ask you questions and you're not there you're for there for a couple hours or whatever and then uh i think they take they might arrange some school visits or at the very least i did some school visits while i was out there and then they have at the museum is a beautiful facility and they have a big theater there where they show movies, you know, obviously, but they also can have like small live performances. So I went and I did presentations there a couple of times. They had like, they closed the school for homeschool day one day and they just brought in all these homeschooled kids and they got to you know explore the museum. And then it ended, they came and they did like an hour with me in the, in the theater. And it was just so fun because it, the, you could see his studio and you could see the museum and then you could see the the roller or the roller skating yeah the ice skating rink that he built at the warm puppy cafe and see the the little table he sat at every day and had his his english muffin it was actually it was a magical experience i could i had this is my story i'll tell about it then my whole family was invited which was great we flew in landed in san francisco and got a car and we're driving from santa or from San Francisco to Santa Rosa and the GPS is on and it's saying, you know, make a left, make a right, make a left. And we're supposed to, and I'm just getting more excited by the the second that I'm going to get to, you know, do this. And Mrs. Schultz is going to actually meet me at the, the museum where she's kind enough to let me stay at her house. They had a guest house at the time. So I'm getting more excited. And the GPS is saying, you know, go North, go so whatever. And then if, as we pull into the, parking lot of the Charles Schultz Museum where I am artist in residence, the GPS says, congratulations, you have arrived at your destination. Mm. And I thought, (laughs) how wise is my GPS? I have arrived. And I met Mrs. Schultz and she was so nice. And she said, hey, um, follow me up to the house. But just in case you get lost, here's the address. So I'm like, no problem. I got a very wise GPS. So (laughs) I get back in the car. I plug her private address into the GPS and the GPS says, I'm sorry, your destination is unreachable. (laughs) And I thought, how wise is my GPS? (laughs) So thanks Katie. That is what it's like to be a, an artist in residence. 
So, hey, that's uh, that's the questions we got. If you guys out there have any other questions or comments or just want to get in touch with us, you could do that uh, through social media. We're Unpack Peanuts at both Instagram and Twitter. And you can also email us through our website, unpackingpeanuts.com. And that's where you can sign up for the Great Peanuts Reread and you can vote for your favorite strips of the year. Have you guys been keeping your eye on who's winning strips of the year? Yeah, I'm bombing out. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> who's who's in the lead? I think Jimmy and Michael, you are doing really well. You 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 both get a lot of a lot of response. So well, that's because I go on every night and I vote three times for myself <laughs> before I go to sleep. So if you want to stop my voting shenanigans, get on there, people, and uh, give Harold a boost with some votes. All right, how about we take a break here? And then we have a little surprise for our listeners when we come back. We're going to talk about one of the great influences on Charles Schultz and Peanuts. So stick around and we'll be right back. And we're back. Did you miss us? So listen, I I, I have a little surprise for you listeners out there. Uh, I thought we would take a few moments to look at one of uh, the great influences on uh, Mr. Charles Schultz and his comic strip, Peanuts, uh, a strip which has been lost uh, for most of comics history, but has been in print now for the last decade or so, uh, put out by IDW. And if you want to follow along with these, they're also on Go Comics. And the comic strip is Skippy by Percy Crosby. And uh, it was a very popular strip. It is a kid's strip. It has a little bit of intellectual heft. And uh, for more context, I turn you over to my pal, Harold. Well, thanks, Jimmy. (laughs) Um, So Skippy, it's hard to imagine. You know, there's certain things that for whatever reason, culturally or historically, something is just huge in its time. And then it disappears in in memory and we don't realize how influential or how big a part of of the culture it was in its time skippy is an example of that charles schultz would mention this every so often and he would say you have to check out skippy skippy's forgotten um skippy should not be forgotten he was he was such such a, a cheerleader for this strip and it meant a big a lot to him and he wasn't the only one. Um, this strip was uh, around for quite a while. It started in 1923, actually not as a comic strip, but uh, as, well, at least not a syndicated comic strip. It was in a weekly magazine called Life, not that life. Again, this is another thing that's lost to history. There was a, a I guess you could call it a, it was a pre-New Yorker, New Yorker magazine. It was a little bit lighter. They, they, define themselves as trying to capture casual cheerfulness. So it was a New York based magazine and it was smart and it was funny. And for years, it was just a very successful magazine. In fact, it lasted over 50 years, but it's almost forgotten now because in 1936, as it was waning, um, they sold life to guess what time magazine, Henry Luce of time magazine, because he wanted the name. So within a month of the last issue of the original life, which was, you know, a little like a, like a, yeah, I guess you could say a a light New Yorker kind of magazine, all of a sudden it became this hugely popular picture magazine. Uh, And it's so funny that it didn't miss a beat and that Henry Lou so loved that title. He wasn't worried about confusion or anything. He's like, no, that's the title. I'm buying your magazine so that I can use your title. Very strange, but wow. but Skippy appears in 1923 in Life, and um, is instantly popular. And two years later, it becomes syndicated, and goes on for a 20 year run. And uh, Jerry Robinson called Percy Crosby the cartoonist's cartoonist, and he described uh, Skippy as fantasy with a realistic base. Which you know, when you think of Peanuts and you think of the world of Snoopy and all of that. Uh, and the kite eating tree, there's definitely that influence in Charles Schultz's work. And to give you an idea of how popular Skippy was in its day, in 1931, there was a movie made of Skippy. Um, so basically, a, a little kid, a kid movie, right? Jackie Cooper played Skippy. Some of you may be familiar with that name. Jackie Cooper was in uh, the Our Gang shorts Got it. and was very popular for the Our, Our Gang shorts. Yeah, he he had a good long career himself. 
he was still in television. He was a, he was a guest in Hawaii Five O and Colombo and the Rockford Files. He was definitely a, a star for years and years and years. Last movie was nineteen eighty seven. He was in uh, he was Perry White in Superman Four: The Quest for Peace. Wow. Oh, so wow. anyway, he, and he was nominated for a Academy Award at age of nine for this movie. So obviously, this film had a big impact. Uh, it was also nominated for Best Picture. And one for best director, the youngest director to uh, win, Norman Torog, when he was 32 years old. Apparently that didn't get beaten. That record didn't get beaten until La La Land uh, won. So it's a long, long wow. run for basically some young people with young ideas taking the world by storm. 1931, 1932 to 1935, there's a radio show that apparently made Wheaties very popular for, <laughs> for its sponsor. And uh, there was a, he put out a novel. And Percy Crosby was, I mean, just a fascinating guy. He was an inventor. He certainly was a writer. He was a philosopher. He got a lot into political philosophy and uh, wrote a number of books. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a sad story to him. Should we get to that now? Yeah, you might as well. No use sugarcoating All it. right. Well, this is probably, these are some of the reasons why we don't know about Skippy anymore. So he's making in today's dollars about two and a half million dollars a year at the peak of this, probably in the 30s. That's pretty impressive for the 1930s to for an artist to be making that kind of money. I am adjusting it upward for what today's dollars would be, but it gives you a sense of how popular he was. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1891. He dies in 1964, but he was committed to an insane asylum to Bellevue, the famous Bellevue, after attempting s- suicide in, in 1948. The strip ended in 1945, so he had a very quick downward spiral, I think, in the in the 40s. Uh, he, I think it was issues with alcoholism, problems, uh, family problems. His own daughters didn't even know he was in an insane asylum. They hadn't seen him for years. So it's just a really, really sad story uh of somebody who was in his time was was brilliant and was taking comic strips to where they hadn't been before but then a series of just bad bad things bad timing um he he kind of fell out of favor and lost everything and it's just a very tragic story yeah it is and it's sad because there's a lot of tragic cartoonist stories yeah that's true you know which is which is which let is me awful. tell you let me tell you about mine. <laughs> Cue the violins. <laughs> so, okay, so we read a bunch of them. I, I went through and I picked out some that I thought were interesting, some that were different, some that were relevant, and I sent them to the guys. Uh, so let me uh, just get, what's your unvarnished uh, first opinion? Michael, Let me. what do you think of Skippy? Uh, boy, I really think you had to be growing up roughly in that period, the Depression era. I mean, these characters mm-hmm. are kind of the classic street kids, kind of badly educated, using kind of a weird street slang. The art I found really difficult to read. He's got this gestural style, which I know a lot of people like. It's just very loose and scratchy. And the the facial expressions seem almost lost in like this maze of lines sometimes. Whereas Schultz, I mean, it's crystal clear what the characters are thinking. And looking at Skippy, it's sort of like, you know, it seems like his mouth would disappear. It looks like sometimes he has three eyes. Is it, there are all these facial lines that don't seem to add anything. It looks almost to me like like underdrawing like construction lines for the head that aren't aren't erased or something yeah yeah and you know that's that's a big thing to a lot of people i know there's you know the japanese art where you're basically supposed to just put your pen down on paper and and just draw it all without any corrections Mm -hmm. or even thinking too much i was really confused on who the characters are and finally realized Skippy is only distinguished by this insane hat he wears. <laughs> and if it wasn't for the hat, I'd have no idea which one was Skippy. 
Uh, yeah, the there's the one strip I'm looking at right now where the one kid is uh, fishing and Skippy comes up to him. Like if you relettered it, it could be somewhat like a devil and angel character or where it's like two sides of the same person. There's very little to, to differentiate the two. Yeah. The influence on Schultz, because I mean, people talk about it. Schultz talks about it is there's a lot of strips where it's two kids you know, just sitting out on the sidewalk or on a uh, on a bridge and talking, and with a punchline in the last panel. But I'm not quite getting these punchlines. To me, they're not funny. They're just odd. So it's all very odd. But I, I do see that Schultz. If this was really the first strip to do this with these these kids sitting around philosophically talking about life. Like, yeah, you know, Schultz saw this in the 30s when he was growing up. He might have said, you know, that's what I want to do, something like that. Yeah. Harold, what about you? Well, one thing interesting to me about Schultz is that he he suggested that Peanuts was a strip that was sophisticated. And then he mixed that with this term innocence. So it's kind of that wisdom and innocence thing that Schultz was really into to capture somehow that I think he could say the precursor to that and there was no other like it was was Skippy. So in that regard, I, I really do think that Skippy was a genuine inspiration to him of what was possible. And I go through these trips, I was struck by the the breadth of what they're covering and how they, how he treats these characters. I mean, he's got, he's got them doing the, uh, the Calvin and Hobbes go kart down the hill thing. He's got, he's got uh Skippy uh, kneeling at the side of his bed uh, praying, which is weird because it, it's got that patchwork quilt uh, cover. Like I, I just did a strip for sweetest beast where there's a, and I, for some reason I use the patchwork coat cover. I don't know why that is or who started doing that, but uh Certainly, he was an early guy. Who's doing? He's doing visual gags that have no no words. He has other strips that probably have a hundred words or more in them. Incredibly talky and playful, playful with words, with loads of literary references. The guy's super well read. And then there's some of that are just visually stunning. There was one uh, J- Jimmy picked out a number for us to kind of look at together. And there's one from December twelfth, nineteen twenty five, that shows this beautiful sketchy. Um, grandfather clock and uh, then you see skippy in his bed looking out at us with the, those those little orphan any kind of circle eyes that don't have pupils in them and then there's a the last panel is a shot outside of his house at night looking over the town and it's 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 pretty stunning it's very sketchy makes me think of like the charles dana gibson kind of school of 1920s yeah. art where they were loosening up the style to kind of betray the fact that this was pen and ink. And he's definitely doing that with, with his artwork. And uh, so I can see why other cartoonists would have looked at this and said, you know, he's, um, he's, he's breaking some new ground or he's, he's going places I wouldn't dare go with my art. I have to tighten my art up. I have to make it clean and read. One of the odd things about Skippy is that, if he, even if he's drawing a background, sometimes the background won't go to the edge of the page or the edge of the edge of the panel. And mm-hmm. so you have these these white spaces around the characters that almost look like he drew something and he pasted it into a panel and it's it's not filling the space or he might fill the space with just a swirly line. He's he's definitely doing a lot of things that show tremendous confidence as an artist. But I agree with Michael that I could see this would be off putting, which makes it even more fascinating to me how popular it actually was that people went with him to a place that I think they might have rejected with a lesser artist. Yeah, I think, you know, it's I think the thing Schultz got visually from it is that it is it is inked quickly. And I would I don't know. I'm sure someone actually knows what he inked with. But you know what my guess is, what? is that it's a fountain pen hmm. because there's a little bit of a variation in line, but there's not a lot of variation in line. And this thing is being drawn at light speed, you know, especially some of those marks in the background where it's just scribbles indicating nothing, really just scribbles in the background. I mean, they were slashed out. And then I think some things like maybe the um, 
the landscape you were talking about, or there's another one for the December 23rd, 1925 strip where I, that's definitely done with some sort of you know, Charles Dana Gibson uh, pen nib. I, hey, Michael, who is, if you were to think and name a cartoonist that this most reminds you of visually, do you have anybody off the top of your head? I have a weird pick and I'll see what you think. No, but it, cartoons or newspaper strips from this era, I find very difficult to read. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, there's a little bit of uh, a little Nemo, but little Nemo is so tight with all the beautiful. Yeah, but the lettering is just rough. <laughs> yeah, no, this is better lettering than little Nemo. I, how he could invent animation, be the greatest draftsman in history and not figure out that you put the words in before you write. Mystifying. Around it. Amazing. <laughs> Mystifying. Uh, no, you know who reminds me of Eddie Campbell? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that total scratchy, um, like impressionistic, expressionistic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, for me, yeah, I'm not going to laugh out loud at it. But boy, did I, I was shocked at seeing the go-kart go down the hill. Because I assumed I ripped that off from Bill Watterson, Calvin on the sled. But then I think, well, he must have ripped it off from here. But actually, I doubt he's ever even, he not, I'm sure he's seen him now. But I think when he was up and coming, they would have been, impossible to come by it must be in the smithsonian book I which have, everyone I had have that but i, I don't, don't remember, remember seeing much skippy, skippy in being in yeah, it i don't remember it no if uh, anything it would only i don't rem- i don't think it's in there at all which is crazy right if it was that popular the only reason i knew anything about skippy was was charles schultz whenever he'd bring it up in a book that i'd read as a yeah. kid and i'd like and, you, and you'd think about it like yeah it's like this this um, huge thing that somehow you've never come across <laughs> and it just never showed up, and right. you, and then in time you start to wonder, well, why didn't it show up? And then you you got to hear the, the you know the, the weird story. But going to your your artwork, there's a fascinating strip in the selections that you picked, Jimmy. That is Skippy at a museum. Oh yes, and you're going left to right across the wall of the museum, and the artwork of like six or eight of these very impressionistic uh, curvy mondrian kind of looking paintings then lead to the far right corner where we see um something that says rembrandt on the frame and it looks like there's a lot more detail in the strip and and skippy is saying "Mm, a new school and uh which i thought was pretty pretty funny and then the thing that really strikes me looking at it though is he's doing his sketchy style version of a Rembrandt. He's, he's not trying to recreate the Rembrandt. So in its own weird way, it's super impressionistic, like the things on the left, except they're less, it's less geometric. Exactly. Which is just absolutely, I I get the sense that when I read these things, I get the sense that this is being written and drawn by somebody a lot smarter than me. I mean, like IQ off the charts, (laughs) smarter than me. And he's trying (laughs) to find his way back to speak to the plebeians like me. That's the feeling I get when I read these strips, because <laughs> uh, you know, and then knowing knowing his history, uh, he just seemed to have a mind that did not stop, and ultimately that was his downfall. And so that's kind of the tragic side of somebody who was really yeah. smart, just not able to to get back into the world with everybody else. That's kind of the feeling I get. Uh, very sad, but yeah, that's exactly everything I wanted to say about that strip because to for him to depict what is meant in the world to be a gorgeous, you know, fully rendered oil painting, it, figural, you know, with actual subjects versus abstract art, but they're both abstract art in the strip, but it still works to convey the reality of the Rembrandt painting. It's it's bizarre that it works, and I'm not even sure how. I, I don't either. And I for those of you playing along at home, if you want to find this, go to gocomics.com and in their calendar, you can click on the date and you and you can pull up whatever year you want. Look for July 27th, 2017. There's just a lot to to parse out in this strip. One other thing I will point out, Jimmy, that every time I look at this, I'm seeing something new. And I'm like, this is crazy, insane. How did he just know to do this? He has this weird uh, series of horizontal lines that are very close to each other that flow from the upper left-hand corner of the strip down through the kind of the the eye line of these these multiple yeah. 
paintings that are, are abstract. Uh, and then it kind of curves its way down to below where uh, Skippy is standing. And then it starts up again at, at the base of his body and then leads you up to the Rembrandt. It's totally unashamedly guiding your eye through this strip. <laughs> yeah. He wants you to see, you have to see the, these strips on the left first, which you might skip over. And he knows that. And you uh-huh. get this is the last thing he probably put into the strip, right? Where those lines. Right. He's, I've got to guide the eye. And he does it in this blatant way, which in its own way is a super artistic and kind of <laughs> abstract. It's, it's, it's just, it's yeah. Remarkable. And yeah. And that does, that just kind of is there. Uh, like, I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it now, but it's a hundred percent true. Well, okay. So here's my question to you guys. I don't know if you can call it up right now, but um, you might remember we, I sent the August 22nd, 2014 strip, which is, uh, a bunch of horses running around the racetrack with yeah. okay how long do you think it took him to draw this it uh, is as, as much time as it took for those horses mm-hmm. to run about by. a minute and a half okay what do you think yeah it's kind of an, uh, an assignment they give you in art right. school well uh, harold what do you think you think it's, it'd be short like that as well <sighs> it looks i mean i don't have any insight yeah. i'm not going to be able to pull out and go no it took him through it just... looks like yeah, it looks like a quick sketch that you would make to get to capture something that's happening be, while he's at the racetrack. You get that feeling like he's right there watching it happen. He's got to capture it in sketch form as he's doing it, and that's that's remarkable. And I, you know, and again, to, going to Michael's point, I just want to say I, I agree that the looseness of this of the art style fights my eye. I really have to I really have to commit to to read what what's here because it's rough and it's uh you have to put the pieces together and I historically have not been good at I artists who are absolutely loved and admired I I think of some of a Joe Kubert's work uh, of the character is it Tor like the Tarzan type of character he had a famous logo for his Joe Kubert school of of tour that is done with these really quick oh, yeah. blotchy art styles and often he'll be up against like trees that are basically blotches yeah. of ink and i have to fight i'm looking at a rorschach thing when i when i see that i have to fight to make it <laughs> sense of it and other people i think maybe can put that together faster than my mind can so i have resistance when i read the strip but at the same time i mean the guy knew what he was doing and he was absolutely intentional and so, yeah, it, it looks incredibly fast, almost and too fast for my for my brain to be able to process some of the drawing. Well, the reason I was sort of asking it, it, the only thing I knew about him before, you know, recently was from the, the little Schultz would say. And I I remember it might be in the Gary Groth interview in Comics Journal where he says something like he talks about how rough and how fast the strips were. And then Schultz obliquely references alcoholism he's like but i don't know anything about his alcoholism or anything like that so in my mind i was like oh this is what he is it's some guy who is trying to put the minimum amount of time into drawing something right he might have like all his time is in his head clearly he's thinking all of this through but he's drawing it very quickly so but then i thought okay so if you were going to task yourself with drawing something super fast would you choose drawing seven horses going around a racetrack right. with people in the stands that's an in- drawing a horse is famously the hardest thing in the world these are just scribbles but i can tell that there's seven race horses racing around the track and you can tell that there's anatomy in there and you can tell it, you yeah know, it's this is not where they're yeah where, what sta- stage of gallop they're in you could see the background the stands in the background almost like that's almost like a manga blur effect. So it's it's odd. Like I could definitely see whipping out some of the other ones, the no background strips quickly. Yeah. But the fastest looking one still seemed like the hardest. Well, to draw. The, and the the thing that really sticks out to me in this strip, and again, it, it, you if you if you go back and look at something a second time with these Skippy strips, there's there's always seems to be something that's my jaw kind of drops. The whole gag on this strip, it's a single panel daily strip. So again, if you're playing at home, take a look at this strip. The 
left hand side shows Skippy and who knows who <laughs> in a extremely extremely rough drawing, much rougher than the um, than the horses. Is Skippy on a? You can just tell there's barely a fence on this home stretch on the on the curve of this of the stretch of this racetrack, and the joke is that he helps give him a hand. Uh, as they're going around the bend one of his one of his proudest moments in his life but the drawing of skippy and his friend is the most abstract blobby thing you have ever seen you just barely get the meaning of it it's you have to fight to see it and yet i can tell that skippy is waving his hat yeah. and i kind of think that the other kid has the the track newspaper you know rolled up in his hand wow <laughs> How do you... am i imagining that <laughs> I, I there's something I know I, I don't, don't I think, think you probably the hat. You I'm not probably get it. The yeah. but imagine this was printed in a newspaper on newsprint with no, bad plates God. what on earth did it look like to people who were reading it it's much I, I don't know it, it's just it's crazy but it is true he he was he did have trouble with alcohol and but this would have been maybe starting in the the mid to late 20s and then he he gets he gets off of alcohol for a number of years uh, from the twenties into the thirties. And then, and then I think he, he kind of falls back in around 1939 or something. So there's a period where he's not drinking and whether, where it falls with these strips, I don't exactly know, but it would be fascinating to go back and look and see if, you know, how the art changes, if at all, during these, these rough patches in his life. Because I mean, the thing is that by by 1945, the fact that this was he was making two and a half million dollars in the 30s, and by 1945, his syndicate won't renew his contract. And you know how hard it is to kill a strip in a newspaper. I mean, that thing will sit there forever. The things that have been around for 75 years that are on the fourth artist, they don't even know what they're doing. They don't care. They're just doing it for a paycheck. As there's no reason for that strip to be there except that there's a sentimental attachment to what people remember the strip to be, and yet. Percy Crosby was done by 1945. Now, I don't know if they were just noting something, er noticing something erratic in him. And this is the other piece I want to mention that's going to, I think, lead into ultimately what you talk about, uh, Jimmy, regarding this lawsuit that's famous in the annals of, uh, of, uh, of litigation in the United States, is that he owned the copyright because he created the strip in life and then he went to a really small syndicate, picked it up, then it hopped to another syndicate, then wound up at King Features. By the time he got to King Features, he had established that he owned the copyright to the strip, which is not a thing. It, that just shows the power he had and how big this thing was, that by the time it got to King Features, who would dictate the rules, we own the copyright, we own the characters, he didn't do that. And, and in that regard, I think that also is a reason why, why Skippy is not remembered today is because there was no gigantic company to push it on and have it remembered and survive. So in 1945, they're like, well, we don't own this thing. We're not going to, we don't want to deal with you anymore. You know, there would have been a Skippy mm -hmm. from 1945 to 1983 if King features had owned the character, right? But that didn't happen here. It was kept in his family and his estate. And because of the sad story of how everything kind of went into decline and was estranged from family members that I think that would explain when a, and when a family owns something, we were talking about how well Schultz's family has done with keeping the integrity of peanuts. It usually doesn't go that way. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. I worked for Archie mm -hmm. and we were onto the third generation when I was at Archie and they were, you know, they were owning it and protecting it. But Archie is not owned by, you know, Time Warner or owned by <laughs> owned by uh, Disney or or some other gigantic conglomerate. It's owned by the family. And in a way, you, you can keep the integrity of something, but you can also make it almost impossible because how many families know how to do business deals and deal with lawyers and, you know, it, it, stuff often gets gummed up like Walt Kelly's family owned a lot of the Pogo stuff. And I think one of the reasons Pogo is is, le is not as well remembered today is because the family who are stewarding it are doing their best, but they're not a giant corporation. They just don't know how to manage something as complex as a, as a multi multimedia property. It's not easy. And Skippy, I think, is definitely uh, the victim of all of these, this conflagration of bad things 
so we don't we don't know the strip today it's a really depressing story actually and you know it, what's what's depressing about it from a cartoonist point of view is it's like well you have two choices you can keep the rights to your thing uh but you'll probably die broke alone in an asylum somewhere or you could sell the rights to your thing like superman and have it become a multi-billion dollar brand the world over and you can die alone penniless in an asylum so <laughs> those are our choices I, I, yeah I, that's the choice those are the choices yeah you know? <laughs> yeah it's the best i do love being a cartoonist i have to remind myself several times a week yeah. but i, I used do. to paste over my um, over my drawing board when i was working on pro projects <laughs> and <laughs> it said i love to do this <laughs> <laughs> I looked up everyone. So, oh, that's right. That's right. I love to do this. That's right. I wanted to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, just to bring it back to Schultz, around 1932, this food company out of California starts putting out peanut butter and they call it Skippy. And if you, you have to look at the original jars of Skippy, but if you look at the original jars of Skippy, it was uh, like brush lettering on a fence on a on a picket fence of uneven size and crosby owned the trademark for skippy and actually was able to shut this down and and tell the the, the peanut butter people that they couldn't do it but then he went into an institution and uh, the company persisted and eventually they were able to they just had enough money and enough lawyers to basically bully their way through the legal system and say we want to continue doing this yeah. so even when there were some judge they finally got judgments them. against them right i mean it basically so yes. this is illegal stop it and they didn't stop it and and it's yeah. like they, didn't they get, couldn't no, get it right. to be enforced it's so bizarre right and an, an unenforceable thing and schultz got um brought into this as an expert witness for the trial and he writes about it in his book you don't look 35 charlie brown and he writes about it I, with a little sense. It's not, I wouldn't say bitterness, but a little sense of disillusionment or whatever, because he, I guess he took it very seriously. He, and he went and he was put on the stand and he testified that if he were to take something from Skippy and have it it'd just be an icon that would represent the, the strip, it would either be, he said, Skippy's go-kart or the, the fence that they have on in Skippy's lettering. And that's basically what it is. And when we go through the strips, we will see uh, Skippy and his pals hanging out at the fence uh, that looks very similar to the to the one on the Skippy peanut butter. Uh, so Schultz testifies. And then this is this is how he ends the story. And this is what I just think is pretty funny about it. One of the family members, one of the, the estate says, you know, we'd really like to thank you so much for doing this. And Schultz goes, well, if you'd really like to thank me, I wouldn't mind having a Sunday page. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm pretty and he, which he never got. And he's a little irritated by it at the end. But I'm pretty sure you can't do that. Right. I don't think you could get someone to be uh you know your uh witness in the trial and then give them compensation for it oh right? actually you i think you can aren't there people mm -hmm. who are who make a living being a star expert witness oh oh if you're a professional oh so interesting. I, I don't know if they paid him anything he probably just did it because he wanted to help the family out but yeah you, you can be paid for yeah it as he an definitely expert. did not get paid for yeah it. like if you were a yeah, witness to the crime i think that might be a an issue <laughs> <laughs> i guess that's true that is the difference yeah <laughs> Well, I was going to be outraged. You know, but <laughs> but my, my understanding is the family to this day, like they, they filed the motion as of like 2020. Yeah. I mean, we're talking 87 yes. years this has gone on and yes. it, they have not, they have not yeah. dropped this. This is, I don't know of any lawsuits that have gone longer, but maybe there is something. Why, why wouldn't at this point, why wouldn't the peanut butter people just go, here's some money, like, please. Like at this point, I mean, it's been going on, I guess, because they, why they don't need to. I mean, yeah. If they, if they had right. more publicity, I guess at some point the word, word would get out and maybe they would, they would try to resolve it. But what a, what a mess. Like, I know I was like Superman and like, you're talking about Superman and Captain Marvel yeah. when, uh, when Fawcett was doing its version of a superhero and, yeah. and it became more popular than Superman and DC sues them. Um, they've been around for a, a few years before they do it, but it becomes super popular. But that went over and on for like 
was it like 12 years or something before it finally got settled or 10 mm -hmm. years? It's crazy. Well, and then Captain Marvel in Britain was turned into a ripoff called Marvel Man. And then that ended up in a oh, lawsuit that lasted gee. a decade. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other joy of comics, right? You know, just get, the, get exactly. your popcorn out and it's going to be a long ride. Look, for you listeners out there, if I could just have convey two things through this podcast, it's one, read Peanuts. It's a great comic strip. And two, buy Jif. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how about we read, uh, to wrap up, we'll read three Skippy strips and uh, see what we think. Sound good? Sure. sure. July 17th, 1931. Skippy and Skippy's friend, let's call him Pete, are hanging out very similar to the way Charlie Brown and Linus will hang out on the Stonewall, but they are hanging out over the future Skippy peanut butter logo. And, they are, and Skippy says to his friend, what are you going to get for Christmas? And the friend says, I don't know. We never get nothing. Me mother gets all the presents. And in the last panel, he continues saying, three years running now, we got twins. By the way, I have spent the last 30 years trying to not have the faux Irish brogue that comes <laughs> from living in the coal region. And, and I resent having to read these strips. <laughs> So what do you think, guys? It looks uh, we can see something similar to, to peanuts here for sure, right? The setup, yes. So what'd you get for Christmas? I'd expect a, a bigger joke. At least one I can understand. Well, and I also just meant hanging out at the wall. Yeah, you know, that's the thing that struck me. Yeah, I don't get the twins thing. What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't the isn't the joke that uh the only person getting presents for Christmas is mom. And she's, she's gotten twins three years running that yeah. she's, she's That's had twins. Joke. And that was, those were the Christmas presents as, as told to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not going to be a knee slapper no matter mm -hmm. how you look at it, yeah. but yeah. For those of you who again are willing to go to gocomics.com and take a look at this uh, artwork, you'll have to find it not under the date Jimmy gave, but actually November 22nd, 2018, <laughs> Um, they sometimes date them the year they, the day they came out in originally, sometimes <laughs> they've got it on a schedule to come out the day they actually upload it to go comics.com. So this is an oddity where, yeah, go to November 22nd, 2018. You can check out Skippy. All right. Here's another one. I think this one's pretty funny, but maybe we can edit it. May 7th, 1930. Some kid is talking to Skippy. The kid says, my Uncle Louie says the radio racket ought to be looked into by the government. Skippy says, what's he got against the radio? The other kid says, it started on account of a sermon he heard last Sunday. The kid continues, he said he never heard such an elegant sermon before in all his life, and he made up his mind to become a better man. Skippy says, yeah, but that's no reason to get sore. And the other kid says, I know, but he was listening to it for over an hour before he found that it was coming from a different church than his in. <laughs> okay. Jeez. Now, okay, but like you could you could edit this with modern language and it's relevant and it's funny. Right? So is it just the odd just the remove of time that keeps us from appreciating it? I'd like to read more of these strips all together and just see if I get into its groove. You know, again, like, you know, read all of the what happened in 1927 or 1936, because I, I'm feeling, well, I keep bringing up Little Orphan Annie, but Little Orphan Annie's got some some kind of rough off putting art. People, some people can't stand those, which and both both strips have it here. These eyes that are essentially uh, circles with white in the middle. There's no pupil in the character's eyes and that bugs some people to know and they cannot look at, at these strips just because of that. But once I got into reading the strips and got familiar with the art and the characters, then I was just pulled into the storyline. And I'm thinking maybe the same thing happens here. If you, if you, if you, well, through. but there is no storyline, at least as far as I but, could. Uh, okay. I maybe, but, but in terms of it being a barrier, the art is not, a barrier after time because you you get to understand the cues of that's what this is that's what this yeah. is these instead of noting that noticing a, a squiggly line next to the character you're just you're just taking it in you you understand the rules of the artwork yeah. after a while well once you once you understand that 
they're all identified by what the ridiculous hats they wear. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing is, this is a mass market art form, right? I mean, we talk about how Crazy Cat survived because William Randolph Hearst loved it, and a lot of intellectuals loved it, and some editors loved it. And the general public couldn't stand Crazy Cat. They're like, why is this in my newspaper? <laughs> but, but but Skippy was a genuine success, it seems like, all around. It's like people liked Skippy. Um, so that's, yeah, I'm trying to look at it through the, that lens. Michael's like, why did this work? And why did people accept it and take it for what it was in that era? And and he's, he's much more in the zeitgeist of artists at the time. He mentions like... A, Fontaine Fox and Tunerville Trolley, one of the strips Jimmy picked out. And mm -hmm. and I think of that art style. And I agree, Michael, that stuff yeah. is, is off-putting to my eye. I have to get past the art to appreciate what the artist is doing because the style, it, it's so much of its time. And H.T. Uh, Webster, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He created the the professor, Mr. Milk Toast, the whole term Milk Toast being a mild character put that into the the public consciousness and he was super popular he would often do these single panel comics um and i think of that art style it's 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 kind of it's sketchy the the line art is is kind of draws attention to itself but maybe not so much when everyone's doing it i don't know uh, i just think people were different in, the, in them days <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very much like a, a broadcast from a different uh, just a totally different culture in a way the peanuts isn't yeah the clothing like you said like the, the clothing with the gigantic yeah. tie and the, he's wearing a, a suit coat essentially with short pants it's yeah it's like you you have to you have to process every piece of this in order for it to come together in your mind yeah yeah, you know what? That's interesting because a lot of times when you have to spend a lot of time sort of decoding the art, it's because the art is so um, ornate. It's like Hal Foster or whatever, and you're just like marveling over the little details and stuff. But in this, you're trying to figure out kind of what's happening. But but at the same time, where gosh, where he's sitting there on the curb and he's leaning his his forearm on his one knee and his other arms on his hip. I mean, it's really the guy could really draw. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, and I don't, you know. It, and it's it, and it's, it's weird. It's very of the strips you pick, the ones that really stand out to me are when he has a lot of black ink on the page. He's walking mm -hmm. past a fruit stand, and oh my gosh, it's or the fruit stand reminded me of stuff that you would see in Schultz, like the Five and Dime or the um, like the train track, the model train tracks he does and stuff like that, where it's just all that detail. Yeah, I really like. He does that. one in in silhouette where we're looking, like looking at a, I guess, a setting sun or a rising sun. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at the back. Oh them. yeah, that's another one. And oh, it's it's gorgeous, yeah. and that one reads for me because I can I can figure out what's happening quickly because he's he's taken most of the detail away, and you're just seeing silhouette, and all of a sudden I can get to the joke and I can get to the the feel of it much better than these strips where it's it's mainly just line art. There's no shading. There's or not major shading. It's weird. I think that was my favorite visual strip. And we're talking about on Go Comics, it's August 5th, 2017, but it was actually published on June 7th, uh, 1930. And again, no Photoshop or anything like this. He had to draw the two characters in silhouette in the tree in that really gestural style, but three times, but they look beautiful. Yeah. And I'll, I'll throw out one more that I may, may or may not be on your list of ones to talk about, but it's um, December 23rd, 1925. And what is he using? Is Zippa's tone existing in 1925? But he's getting this gray shading all through the strip. That's what I wanted to ask. And it's I, that does not look that, like Zippa tone. To no, me. It, it looks like it was a wash. It very well could be. He he may have had to do some extra things. And given the was an inventor kind of scientific mind, he probably found a way to make this work for the newspapers that that maybe other people didn't really have access to as an artist without some additional effort because he worked for magazines and this was more like a magazine thing that they think they probably could have done. But it's this December 23rd, 1925. Again, it's in silhouette and it, it's just gorgeous. Uh, these, these little, these houses that are, that are kind of hacked out with, with his, his pen and his brush line. And he's walking over this ground that uh, again, is just made up of these, lines but it's very dark but there's gray in the background for the night sky and then he's got a white moon behind it 
beautiful tree with no holding line around the yeah and beautiful tree beh- uh, beneath yep. the uh the moon and then there's a church with the lights on it's just gorgeous i mean i love that i mean if i saw that in the newspaper against all the other strips from 1925 i think that that must have just knocked people out you know who else uh this makes me think of patrick mcdonald yes and maybe that's why i'm thinking of the because he inks with the fountain pen as well yes very much patrick mcdonald vibe to this and patrick mcdonald's huge crazy cat fan again it's all in that kind of that same right. school but yeah totally totally he's he's kind of the guy who's kept that feel going and and even he i think has probably had to struggle with how abstract can i get with my characters and and my lettering even you know he used to have a looser lettering and then i don't know if he got pressured to clean it up i don't know if it's even a font now um it's it's so much cleaner than it was in the earlier days it's like people were saying i can't read Mm -hmm. your strip because the hand lettering is 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 taking me away from the strip i i love it the early stuff you did it's like a knife in my heart to hear (laughs) i know i know (laughs) yeah and generally you know again with michael i agree if i if i look at a 19 mid 1920s newspaper page of of daily strips uh, loads of them have really rough lettering still and then there were some that were getting into learning how to do it like they, they took the correspondence school kind of thing and they found the optimal way to do do letters and that didn't exist for years and so everyone just did their thing but after a while there were a few artists that really tried to make the lettering pop and all of a sudden they really stand out on the page in the strips and i don't think that's quite happening around 1925 i'm trying to think of a strip that had really crisp lettering at this point i, I mean i think of like the early popeye thimble theater stuff i can't think of a strip that had the really clean lettering until you get to like the later twenties and think like moon Mullins and I don't know what else. Um, All of a sudden there's this gorgeous, gorgeous lettering that someone, maybe they're hiring somebody who like (laughs) took the correspondence school. And that's the one thing they do is they letter and and it's as crisp and clean as what you would expect in like most of the run of comic books, like that happened from the forties through to today really is you have to have clean lettering. And that didn't exist back then. No. Well, okay. How about we read one last one and then we uh, we wrap it up. November 23rd, 1927. Skippy comes upon a crying child and he asks the kid, what are you crying for? The kid asks, I'm worried. Skippy asks, what are you worried about? The kid says, I forget. <laughs> I think that's funny. And I think I could see that in Peanuts. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Doesn't have the four. How would Schultz do this? Who you first? You could see him with. It would be like Sally or one of the baby characters as the little kid, and he'd need to add that fourth panel somewhere. Yeah. Was there a strip like this that we read in the fifties? Was there one like that kind of had this gag? Like, well, uh, there's one with Charlie Brown crying, and because we commented on the fact that he was too old to cry, it might be very similar. Except those are characters who have personalities, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah, this is definitely and, you know, we are reading them out of order and stuff. But yeah, this is that is the joke. So this was 1950s Unpacking Peanuts. I'm so happy to be here before we leave. I just have one spontaneous question to ask you guys. You only have one year you can pick. And that's the only Peanuts you could read from the 1950s. Michael, what one year from the 50s would you take to your desert island to read? 1959. 1959 for Michael. 1959. I'm going to go with 1955 just to be different. Hey, uh, listen, so if you guys want to be different, you can uh, follow us on the, uh, on the Instagram and the, and the Twitter where unpack peanuts and you could uh, go to our website, unpackingpeanuts.com, and you could buy a book from us, which would be great because we're all cartoonists ourselves and that would help us out a lot. You could rate and review us wherever you get, uh, your podcast from because you know what we're getting tons and tons of downloads and I'm really excited about that but uh, to be honest we're we're lagging behind on the ratings and reviews so if you could do that that would be fantastic I'd really appreciate it 
This brings uh, to an end our second season. We are going to be back in two weeks where we start the swing in 60s. I could not be more excited. This is my favorite day of the week. Both the, It's the day we get to record and the day you get to listen. And it makes me so happy uh, to be sharing that uh, that Tuesday with you guys. And I also just briefly like to thank Liz for all her hard work, uh, as always, producing this podcast. Would not be here without her. And other than that, from Michael and Harold, I'm Jimmy. Be of good cheer. Yes, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Yes, be of good cheer. (laughs) (laughs) Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. You blockhead!